Um, today we, we, are, we are going to talk about GraphQL. Um, so I just want to see if you know what GraphQL is. Can I show, see a show of hands? I think you all know, perfect. Have any of you used GraphQL before? Very few, but that's, that's still great to hear. So <clears throat> this talk is about the tools you, you might need when you want to run GraphQL in production. And I'm going to mention why that is a bit different. Um, and yeah, let's get started. But before uh, I go on, I'd like to talk about myself. Hello, I, it's me, Arthur. I'm currently working for Kraken Tech uh, as a lead backend engineer, and I'm leading the APIs team, uh, which which makes these tools. So these are the tools our team has been doing, and uh, I, I'd like to present them to you. If you are looking for a new opportunity, uh, or if you'd like to join Kraken, and we have, I think, offices nearly in 10 countries now, or cities, um, cities and countries, uh, please, we have a booth outside, and uh, just join and say hi, and we'd like We'd love to chat to you. So let's jump into these tools. Why do we need these tools? So GraphQL, about five, six years ago, I started using GraphQL. And back then, it was a bit magic, because uh, just a quick introduction. Um, so unlike REST APIs, you, when, when you make a request to a GraphQL API, it's a query language, meaning you just tell the server what you want, and then the server looks at your language, like SQL, and just gives back you the results. But this design is perfect for many reasons, like it uh, lowers the network costs, and it's faster and easier to build, and like has, has tons of benefits. I'm, I'm not going to go over them, uh, that, that's out of scope. But due to this design, you have to treat things differently. And I'm going to present these as problems, and I'm going to show you the tools we've built in Kraken to address them. Some of these newer libraries over five, six years, and growing community of GraphQL Python libraries might eventually decide to address these and have these as built-in tools uh, that you could just pip install and use. But currently, that's not the case for some. But I'm, I know some of these tools are already being de developed in the new GraphQL lib library. So please check them out. So let's start with the first problem. Someone requests too much information. So in a REST API, you have an endpoint, and you, you just hit the endpoint. That's, that's requesting one thing. But in GraphQL, you can request 1,000 things, right? Because no, no one's really stopping you to, uh, to say, OK, you have requested too much. How do we solve this problem? And the problem was, this, this was one of the first things I did when I joined the company was to check the query complexity. And in a simple way, for example, here you see we are requesting a viewer. And let's say this is a GitHub, OK? This was inspired by GitHub. Um, and then you are getting the repositories as nodes, but then you are asking for the name. And for each of those 50 repositories, you are asking for 10 issues. And then you are also displaying the title and body HTML. And when you look at this, it's, it's a big query. And we said, we want to look at this query as a string, and we want to be able to extract things out, and then kind of find a number, get a number, co compute a number about how complex a query is, in a simple way. And and we also would like to take into account the nesting and the parent-children objects, because then uh, the number of objects you are getting and the pressure maybe you are putting on the network or the database or your application grows. So this was what we did. We created this query complexity uh, tool that given 
a query text like this gives you a number. For example, for this case, it's 50 repositories, and for each issue, you also get a different number. But <clears throat> this simple case, we, we have taken it a bit further. We said, um, why not have different coefficients? Maybe some of the queries are more expensive. Maybe they're making network calls. Maybe some of the queries, uh, you have to do lots of SQL and number crunching or CPU things. So each of the thing that is being requested can have a different weight so that while doing the maths, you also put in a coefficient, um, like a multiplier for each of those uh, nodes so that you have a better representation of how, co how complex a query is. So this means, and you, you can have a middleware saying something like, okay, if this query is too complex, don't execute it. Stop here and just raise an error without hitting the database or anything like that. So this is like the entry to your um, API. Related problem is the depth of, of a query. So what is the depth of a query? So imagine something like this. You have foo, and as a child you have bar type, and then before, as a child, you have the author, and then you are looking for posts of those authors, and then you are, for the posts, you get the tags, and for the tags, you display something. So you can imagine th this, this would be a big SQL query if, if these are in different tables or even in different databases. So we, we, we want to say, okay, we allow nesting like this, but we don't really want it to be that nested. And, um, and sometimes it's beneficial, beneficial to have top-level queries uh, for your developers. So um, we just don't want to give the full control to whoever is asking, whoever is ask, asking this. And sometimes you even have this cyclic things. If your types are not designed in a, in a way, um, if you want to crash a server, uh, you, you, you can do this. I mean, um, th this unfortunately works in some GraphQL things at the moment. So you can ask for an author, and you can ask for the author's posts, and then for each author, you can ask the posts, and then you can just go on and go on. And this, this, is, this usually crashes a server instantly. Uh, so we, we didn't want to have this. So we, we created um, a tool just checking for this, or saying, OK, your query is too deep, please. Um, don't go that deep. Uh, this was the sec second thing. <clears throat> so this is a better known problem. It's, it's about access control. Um, and back in the days when GraphQL was young and just developing, uh, most of the libraries that you, you used didn't have um, this access control built in. And th this, this means that uh, the problem of who has access to what is kind of critical. And for REST or other things, this is easier problem because you have an endpoint in REST. If you have access to that, you get that. But what, what happens when you have this graph of things? So you have bl blog posts, you have authors, and authors have other things. And then these are nested things. So you can really traverse the types and those and you can get, you can jump from one type to the uh, to the other, and um, this is a difficult problem to solve in terms of access control. So you have to think about uh, that kind of thing. So what we did was we st we started very simple. We created some decorators um, to to decorate some mutate or query methods, and this this means it, it was a very simple one. Basically, this 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 was just checking if the user can, let's say, update their electricity reading. If the, if the user, and this, this is just the, the logic itself, meaning this is the tool, your passes check is the tool, uh, but the, the logic about that is, let's say, you have to be on the account that you are trying to update, or you could embed other business logic, like has enough time passed between the updates and 
about numbers and validation. So all of that, but this was one thing we did. Until this wasn't really enough, <coughs> excuse me, my, my voice was too much parting last night. Um, so, and then we, in, in our system, it's, it's quite complex. So we don't have a single user model, but we have different user models. And one of the types of users are these organizations. Uh, so it's not like an account user, but it's like a third party organization or third party application. Think of it as OAuth or something. So we wanted to say, we, we would like to define permissions for these types or mutations, and we would, we would like to bundle them in roles so that the roles can be assigned to certain organizations, and once those roles are assigned to certain organizations, those organizations with their API access would be able to systematically get the data they want. Of course, uh, since these permissions are here, it means they can get, they cannot get everything that um, old customer gets, but they, they get less, basically. Okay. The other problem, this is a well-known problem. Um, someone's making too many requests. And uh, the team, we, we have created two tools to address this issue. And these are unfortunately not built in, but we had to create them. And um, our inspiration was, um, again, GitHub for this case. So you might remember the first slide about determining query complexity. So when we look at a query, we kind of know how complex it is. And we said, okay, for a given hour, we would like to define a limit for a user, maybe let's say 5,000 points per hour. And each time they, 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 they make a request and it is successful, we would like to deduct those complexity points from the user's allowance. So this, 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 this is quite smart and flexible because maybe you need to get a lot of data, but you don't really want to be limited like in a, in a basic way. You can get all the data, but uh, this, um, this, this was just uh, creating some fair use of the API because then if you are over your uh, quota, if you, ha you, don't, you don't have any points left, you can't do any more queries and you have to wait some time. This, this is what we have kind of implemented as a custom tool. Uh, but there's also one more thing, and this is, <coughs> excuse me, um, the rate limit. This is a Django library, actually. You, you, can, you can pip install it. It's called Django rate limit. And we kind of took that idea and extended it to, to create some custom logic. And for example, what this does is, um, it is one of our core mutations where you can obtain um, an access token to our APIs. And this means if you fail to log in three times per minute, you are going to get rate limited for, for some time. So th this, this is just, um, this just opens up ways to create different rate limit types. You could, you, you could rate limit by IP, by a user, by a logic. You, you can define the sky is the limit, but this is really essential. And while this is like a, this is like looking at the bigger picture of what user al allowance has to do, this is a really fine grained approach, meaning you can really be specific about this thing and uh, you, you can really uh, tightly control how, how the experience is going to be. Uh, I'm going to talk about a few more tools. We did not write them, but these are must-haves. And I think all of the GraphQL libraries um, include those things, so I highly recommend you use them. And one of the problem is you are asking for something, but the results, let's say a list, has 1,000 items or 10,000 items, and you don't want to display those 10,000 items all because the, the, the client who is asking for it can't even um, show them on a page or, I mean, they can't display them. So the, the, the solution is pagination. So in GraphQL, you could do pagination, and 
all the libraries have tools to do pagination. We, we were using graphene. Uh, so this is how you kind of define uh, the, 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 the connection object. And this, is, uh, this, this means every time someone makes a request, they will be doing the requests in page, sorry, they will be doing the requests in pages. So they can't, you know, return thousand items, but you have to return them in smaller chunks. And the good thing is that you can enforce this. So, and we really enforce this you know, some of on our qu queries, meaning this means you can maximum request 100 items fr from a paginated query. And if it's paginated type, meaning it, if it's something like this, it has a connection type, it, you must include the first or the last argument. And I, I don't really have time to show this as a demo, but you have to say, give me the first 10 items, and then you can say, give me the next 10 items. Or you could say, give me the last 50 items. And then that's how you actually um, construct your query. This is really a must have. And just to conclude, um, uh, how much time do I have? 10 minutes, that, that's good. So these are not GraphQL specific tools, but it's, it's really good to have things when you're running GraphQL. Um, and this applies to many other tools, but I, I just wanted to uh, come up with a few things. So in GraphQL, you don't have you don't really do versioning. You, you, you deprecate things and then you replace them with, with a newer version, so they are both available at the same time. And after some time, you just remove the deprecated version. But the, the thing is, sometimes you want to do breaking changes or you want to communicate this with the stakeholders, people who are using your APIs, your customers, or other companies that systematically consume your APIs. And this is a very hard problem because sometimes if, it's, if, the, if, if the API is public, you don't know who is using them. So you have to create kind of tools to reach them out or they could subscribe to your breaking changes. And then once you say, okay, I'm going to deprecate this in three months, they would be made aware. And for this, to, for this, we have created a Kraken API announcements, which um, sends you an email, has an RSS feed that you could put anywhere in Slack or other RSS readers. It just pops you up, or we even have a blog-like interface, as you see here. <laughs> um, the other problem is uh, knowing when something is not right, or like performance issues. and. Um, you definitely, definitely need good dashboards, um, some in event monitoring about what, what, like the error rates and um, what's been requested and how they perform, or even um, alerts that kind of say, oh, um, something doesn't need, that doesn't look right. Can you please check this so that you could be notified about this from Slack? So these are real must-haves. And the second thing is, you know, this GraphQL looks like, a, looks like magic to some people if they have not used it before. And uh, it's, it's, it's not really common knowledge. So we try things, we fail, we learn, and then we try again, we fail some more, we learn some more, and then we publish these into conventions, the best practices for our internal team, of course. Uh, and sometimes we share those things in conferences like this. But um, long story short, these best practices uh, really encourages people to do things in the tested or best way for that time being uh, until we can come up with other things. So if you are going to do GraphQL, make sure your team, all your team is on the same page about those things. And I think last, Last two items are linters. Um, yeah, those best practices are great, but who reads them? Sometimes people don't read them. So if, if, you, if you can automate something, please, 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 please do, do, do um, automate them using linters. And there are many different linters out there. You could use Flake 8. We've started to use Fixit recently, and we are moving some of our Flake 8 into RAF, meaning if it's a convention and if you can automate it, just do it. And the Fixit library is 
even fixing things for you, like Black does, when, when it, it's not the best practice. It's a bit harder to write, but mm, it saves tons of times. And I think this is my last point. <sighs> the, the pack testing. Now, this is a contract testing. So this means, as a provider, you create a middleman between your consumers and yourself. And this means that middleman, the broker in, in between, can act as a way of making sure the changes on the provider side do not break the consumer or client implementation. Suppose it's a mobile app and it's consuming your GraphQL API or REST API or any API, really. <coughs> The consumer writes a contract, like writes a consumer test, um, specifying precisely how they use the API. They say, I'm calling this endpoint, I'm expecting this HTTP status, I'm re re expecting a body with these items, and in this shape, and in this type, whatever, whatever. You write, they write this as a test. We verify the test, we say, okay, thumbs up. This is correct, we can provide you this. And when we verify this, it's a handshake. It means now we have a contract and it's, it's a pact. And then we upload that to the broker. So anytime any of, of our team is doing a breaking change, boom, the broker says, you are going to break this client's mobile app. Be careful, not, don't, don't do this. So it, this is really a must have. So this is all I ha had to say. I hope you enjoyed the talk. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions, and again, excuse my parting voice. <laughs> Before we break for lunch, let's show our hunger for questions. We have plenty of time for questions. Hi, thank you for the great talk. Uh, I have two questions, actually. Please. Because uh, I also struggling sometimes with GraphQL. And yep. one of the issues we have is uh, we talk about validation of permissions on mutations. Yes. But the same thing goes for queries. And it could be a bit more complex because, let's say, someone has rights to access all of the authors, but for some reason shouldn't have access to posts. And yes. when you have like nested query, how do you solve this kind of situation? So we, um, for a given query, we, we have a middleware that um, traverses all the types and all the children and all their children's children, like until, imagine it like a tree. Mm -hmm. we, we traverse it all and we check on each type where they have, a per, they have the permission or not. If they don't have the permission, we just return none for those things for and this. we raise an okay. unauthorized error. But for the things they do have, then we say, okay, this, this is good and we, we give you the result. So it, the magic is uh, having a middleware that can traverse the relationships of the children nodes and the parent nodes and then just checking if the viewer, if the user has access to those things individually okay. by type by type. Yeah, thank you. And second question uh, is about actually logging the errors in yes. the API, because most of the GraphQL implementation tend to return 200, even though there was yes. an error in the API. Yes. So it's a bit harder to log it and view it in some like Grafana or dashboards. Yeah. So how do you do that? Uh, it's, it's by design that GraphQL returns 200 uh, for the errors. And so we, we, we raise uh, custom events for errors, and not all errors are the same. Errors are unique in our system. So we have these unique error codes. I haven't told those out of time, really. But we have each error is unique with that code, and we kind of lock them on a different system so that we use those events about the errors to display this dashboard or uh, visualize them, not like just, a, we don't depend on HTTP codes because um, they don't work really. Okay, thank you. No worries. Are there any other questions? If not, we can thank our speaker again.